Hello class, we're covering Spanish colonization. Uh, it's also entitled The Black Legend on your assignment sheet. Uh, what we're doing here, are covering the basics of Spanish colonization, and I want to end by um, going over our argumentative assignment as well. Okay, so firstly, if you take a look here at the, um, at the uh, vice royalties of, of Spanish America, right? So you have of New Spain, uh, New Granada, uh, New Castile, uh, uh, Vice Royalty of La Plata. Okay, and so what we're dealing with mainly, of course, in, in a U.S. history class is that of New Spain. All right, and let's jump right into what we're going to cover. All right, so at any rate, evidence for Spanish being excessively religiously fanatical, evidence for exploitation and brutality by the Spaniards toward the Native Americans, the Spanish uh, Americas as being inequitable, right, as unequal, unfair, uh, access and availability and opportunity uh, being, um, you know, based on a hierarchy uh, left out for some people, right? This is all known as the black legend, okay? I don't want you to take this at face value. I want you to look at it. I want you to look for data that supports it. And then we're going to also try to defend the Spanish. And we're going to go about different historical um they call it historiography, uh, different approaches to just conflict history. Remember conflict history, you want to empathize with those who lost socially, politically, and economically, and you kind of make a villain, you vilify uh, those who won socially, politically, and economically. Uh, we'll get into that soon. Uh, so at any rate, revising the black legend, consider the historical and global context. Is Has it been unfair uh, to the Spaniards uh, to decry them as religiously fanatical, exploitative, brutal, okay, and, and uh, forming an, an inequitable society. Then we look at the um, prelapsarian innocence image of natives as being incorrect and condescending. We'll get into that with Las Casas. And then um, uh, look into some fluidity and accountability in a Spanish America. All right, so we're going to look into those things. Also, right, material relevant to test one as well. Uh, organic history of Spanish America or functional history, uh, basically like a, a growing organism, right? You don't look at right and wrong. You don't look at conflict as your uh, your main trigger for change and development uh, in history. But your focus is more upon seeing society as like one big organism, like a human body, let's say, with a metaphor. And you look at each demographic as a part of that body, right? So whether it be uh, Indios or you know Native Americans working on the on the fields, uh, working in the mines. Um, look at the mestizo population of half Spanish, half indigenous uh, that constituted the majority of people in Latin America and Spanish America. Uh, you you look at different uh, you know socioeconomic groups. And what you do is you see, okay, what did they do, this particular demographic do, to help uh, the entire society function? What were their contributions? So it's kind of a, you know, a, more of a neutral um, tone to it uh, when you engage in functional or organic history. Uh, we'll look at that. Uh, geographical claims by the Spanish is also on there, okay, in addition to what we've covered in the previous slide. And support foreign data challenging the black legend, okay, uh, giving the Spanish their due, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll give that a look as well. All right, so uh, moving on, uh, you look at a man named Las Casas, right? Bartolome de Las Casas, a clergyman who had had a, an epiphany, supposedly, right? He sat under a guy named Antonio de Montesinos in the, in the, in the Caribbean. And remember, uh, Columbus came, uh, the, the, the first of... Um, of four trips uh, into the Caribbean in 1492, uh, claimed San Salvador, right, um, as, as his first place, permanent place for Castile, uh, for Isabella of Castile, uh, to be put under her jurisdiction, her constitution, because uh, there, were, there were multiple Spains at this time, you could argue. Um, so at any rate, um, when this happened, right, um, he had um, he had witnessed supposedly, but but more often he uh, engaged in interviews with people uh, with with alleged eyewitnesses. I, I think of like um, Friar uh, Marcos de Nisa and others who contended that they were uh, eyewitnesses 
to some horrific things that the Spaniards did, right? If you take a look here, right, if you'll uh, indulge my uh, gringo acquisition of Spanish. So in the year 1518, they came to rob and kill those who called themselves Christians did so, right? And they have, uh, over, and thus has overflowed and arrived to the limit, right? All the iniquity, all the injustice, all the violence, all the tyranny of those Christians that they have, um, that they've done in the Indies, in the Caribbean, and in, in, uh, uh, in the Americas, right? As they call them, the West Indies. Uh, because from everything, they have lost all fear of God and of the king, and they've even lost a sense of themselves once they got over here and had latitude uh, to conquer the Native Americans. We're going to get into that, okay? So I have that quote there. Um, so in the Caribbean, you have the Treaty of Tordesillas, right? Uh, uh, they're, they're known as the Alexandrine, after Alexander the Sixth, the Pope, uh, the Alexandrine Papal Bulls, and Spain was granted the Americas. Um, uh, everything uh, on a certain up to a certain line, uh, and of course Brazil crossed that line and was given to Portugal instead of Spain on the eastern side of the hemisphere. But at any rate, uh, provided that they Christianize, right? They proselytize, they convert the Native Americans um, as if it were the Americas were the popes to give. Okay, you have the contention of rogue Spanish adventurers. Uh, you find this often in um, in the accounts of Columbus, uh, where a lot of his men uh, who took this clarion call uh, to be able to, um, well, we're going to get into that soon, uh, advance, uh, pasar mejor, uh, to, to get off better, um, to, um, to come over here and come forth as an adelantado, as one who goes forward and claims pagan land, right? So at any rate, uh, you have rogue Spanish adventurers. Uh, notice adventurer is a euphemism because some of them engaged in, in, in murdering and piracy, according to Las Casas, right? So Las Casas, he claims, right, uh, literally when you look at this Spanish literature book, he says the, um, the Spaniards came in como tigres, right? They, they came in like tigers, and they came after the poor, innocent, and, and even Christ-like, even though they had known nothing of Christianity, according to Las Casas, uh, Christ-like humility, uh, the natives, right, who he calls ovejas mansas, right, meek sheep. So he's a Spaniard who is vilifying other Spaniards of his generation, uh, contending in a history book, contending in famous debates back in Spain, uh, that the Spaniards were treating the Native Americans awfully, all right? And so uh, we'll, we'll get into some of his his evidence, okay? Uh, brutality versus the, the Natives, right? Um, and then, uh, like I said, we'll get into a, a few details very soon. And uh, Nicolas de Ovando, he had uh, established an administration that was very hierarchical uh, and, and set up a system in the Caribbean that would be uh, implemented elsewhere in Spanish America. And um, it, it certainly was not egalitarian, putting everyone on equal footing. And it certainly was not democratic, uh, involving a high degree of popular participation in government. All right, the encomienda, encomienda system, right, whereby uh, someone that you had uh, defeated or had sub, uh, submitted to in holy war in Santa Guerra, uh, you were entitled uh, to basically enslave that person, uh, uh, to become your dependent, pay you tribute, uh, uh, primarily in labor, okay? And so at any rate, uh, there are things to show. Now note, right, with the, with the black legend, what the Spaniards called, this is a black legend. Why things bad have to be black is a whole other can of worms. But with the black legend, right, the Spaniards said, this is an awful lie, right? That they're, they're, serve, they're serving as scapegoats uh, to primarily... Uh, not just uh, other Spaniards like Las Casas, but primarily to Dutch and English Protestant historians and chroniclers who had a vested interest, right, in painting the Spaniards as awful uh, colonizers. Not to mention today, right, uh, one could really be tempted to adhere to the black legend. Uh, and I'm not saying that there's no truth to the black legend. I just want you to not take anything at face value. Um, one could uh, be tempted to adhere to the black legend because it, they serve 
as a good anti-model for today's standards, right? So if they're religiously zealous, right? Uh, we say, okay, this is how not to be. This is a good anti-model. We want to teach tolerance today. Uh, they are uh, inequitable and, and hierarchical. Well, we are all about democracy, right? Even though we, we live in a republic, uh, it's a democratic republic, right? That we're about democracy and egalitarianism, everyone equal on equal footing, et cetera, right? And so uh, that's something to think about, right? The Spanish serving as a convenient um, anti-model for today's values. So at any rate, in Mexico, right, you have pillaging conquistadores, you have the massacre of Cholula, you have the death of Moctezuma II of the Mexica or the Aztec Empire, right? Uh, Hernando Cortez and his men came in in 1519. And, um, you know, you have drama right from the beginning. So, uh, for instance, with, with uh, uh, Cristobal Colon, right, or, or Christopher Columbus, when he came into the Caribbean, uh, he issued a, um, an, a military alliance with the Arawak against the hated and feared Caribs of the Caribbean. And it didn't take long, and he left 50 men. And you ought to see his writing, how, how kind of condescending it is. He says so, so often in, in the English translation, um, they're, they're so timorous, they're so timid. Uh, these natives. They know nothing of, of, um, of warfare technology. Uh, with 50 men, we could take the whole island. Um, Ferdinand and Isabella, what would you like? Would you like slaves? They have this and that commodities. What would you like me to bring back to Spain with me? Uh, very paternalistic, uh, very uh, potentially manipulative and Machiavellian. Uh, his tone, when you look at Columbus's letter to Ferdinand, OK, uh, so at any rate, uh, he comes back and Diego Colon's uh, men uh, had been killed at Fort Navidad. And uh, of course, the, Sp the, uh, the indigenous Arawak contended that they had not done it, but that they what the Spaniards were responsible for it, for harassing and even raping the indigenous women. And they, they found a, uh, a wound, supposedly, a hidden wound on the leg of the chief who had made a Treaty of Alliance with Columbus, uh, a gun wound of all things, of a harquebus. And so that was evidence that he had been shot at, had been shot uh, by a Spaniard. So he, they concluded he had lied and that it was, in fact, the Arawak, their own alleged allies, who had killed the Spaniards. And then, of course, the alliance is done at that point. And uh, just a lot of, of um, you know, misunderstandings, conflicts, countered by very vindictive, uh, punitive measures, often by the Spaniards. And before long, they're they're at war. They 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 um they're at war with the Arawak. Initially, they they pretty much declared war right off the bat with the Caribs, and then the Taino, uh, like of uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, some of the rogue Spaniards came and found um, it was gold or silver, and um, they tried to um, extract that and were attacked by the Taino and thus began war with the Taino. So the Spaniards were at war in the Caribbean. It didn't take them long at all in the 1490s. And um, Cortez, supposedly by his own account, uh, lands at, uh, on the coast of Mexico and uh, the, uh, the Tlaxcalans, the Tabascans, and other tribes subjugated to the, subjugated to and or, not and, or uh, allied to the, uh, the Mexica, the Aztec, um, uh, fired upon them. And they had to f literally fight their way to the capital of Tenochtitlan. And so when they get there, it's a fascinating story that I don't know if I want to take all the time to get into. But just know that, that there is one altercation after another, one misunderstanding after another uh, that mushrooms in domino effect uh, fashion and, and turns to war. And so the Spaniards uh, are, are largely routed in La Noche Triste, in the sad night, uh, but they rounded up sources, they rounded up allies who had resented Aztec um, uh, you know, power hegemony over that, uh, over Mexico and came back in 1521 and successfully defeated uh, the Aztec. Um, so 
at any rate, you look at the Cholulan massacre. Uh, the Cholulans were allegedly in the midst of a dance, and they the Spaniards uh, um, under a, a guy named uh, De Alvarado uh, shut all the gates <clears throat> into the stadium and began butchering them. And you look at Las Casas' account, and it, it, it's it's pitiful. He uses expressions like pidiendo misericordia, uh, like you know begging for mercy. But they didn't find it. The Spaniards cut them to pieces uh, as they were unarmed, etc. And look at here, right? That my loose, uh, you know, translation. In order to to put into place and to uh, disseminate or spread uh, their fear, or the reputation of their fear, uh, uh, fear of them, and their uh, braveza, their their um, their their courage, but also even a bit their savagery. Uh, throughout all corners of those lands. So that really technically, according to Las Casas, it was an act of terrorism, uh, whereby they were trying to instill fear with their inferior numbers uh, to, to deter the natives from further attacking them. Uh, so at any rate, we'll get into a, another side to that soon. Uh, my addition would be if, if, if I subjectively were asked uh, to write a history uh, and do it in conflict history fashion and adhere to the black legend, so thus make villains of the Spaniards, and I had to do it in present U.S. territory, I would probably choose New Mexico. Uh, I find a lot of data there. Um, there's an interesting book called When Jesus Came, the Corn Mothers Went Away uh, by Gutierrez, which is very interesting and just fraught with conflict, power plays, manipulation, vindictiveness, uh, just interfighting, uh, etc. So um, you see this here, uh, Don Juan de Oñate, right, in the end of the 1500s, uh, it was literally like 1598 or 99, uh, comes in and claims New Mexico, right, as the adelantado and as like governor. And so as he comes forward, it doesn't take long and he issues the requerimiento and this requirement, right, uh, basically cited the Nicene Creed of the Catholic Church and told the, the opposing people that they had a certain number of hours. And I kid you not, it was like 24 hours or something like that. It was a very short amount of time uh, for them to uh, adhere to the Catholic faith. And if not, they would declare holy war on them. Okay. And then you look at the Santa Fe Rebellion. Uh, if you'll notice how many slides I'm attaching onto your uh, school site, uh, I believe I have 50-something slides, or 66 slides. Um, I have data and details on the Santa Fe Rebellion. You could find uh, some detail in your textbook as well, all right? And so, uh, but just note that in New Mexico, uh, you know, just uh, let me try to give the just the, the gist, is the, the Franciscans did not develop a good reputation. They, they, they developed a reputation for being very uh, coercive, uh, very intolerant. Uh, for instance, when uh, they uh, when a drought ensued, and the uh, some of the indigenous resorted who had been forcefully converted uh, to uh, to become Catholic Christian, uh, resorted to their quote pagan rain dance. Uh, there was a harsh public punishment uh, for those who led the rain dance. Uh, there was a particular guy, Dalgo. Um, who uh, was molesting, allegedly, some of the indigenous kids uh, and getting away with it, and there was no punishment of him. Um, you had uh, a governor who literally had his rivals killed uh, in about 1610. Um, uh, the Franciscan order was fighting with the secular leaders. Uh, just lots, just riddled with conflict. Uh, you had a coma, and that a coma, uh, they went to trade, on this famous hilltop and the Spaniards uh, were ambushed. And so they brought in a punitive expedition and they were told uh, in killing uh, the, the indigenous people of Acoma that they were to merely mortally wound them and allow a priest to come and give them their last rites. Okay, um, so just lots of drama in New Mexico for sure. All right, uh, so let's see here. Uh, old world context, and notice what I'm doing now. I'm trying to add nuance to the black legend, okay? So adding some nuance to the black legend. Uh, 
there were medieval vestiges, right, remaining, and Renaissance assumptions that led to, um, you know, kind of a, a very sharp dichotomy uh, of, of two polarized visions. One, right, was as innocent children, innocent, childlike. Uh, they liken them to Adam and Eve before the fall in the Bible, right, who were naked, but they didn't know it because they were innocent. Their minds were innocent. Uh, you have that notion amongst some of them, and that was perpetuated uh, uh, deliberately or inadvertently by, by chroniclers, and that's a, that's a European who chronicled, who wrote about the indigenous people when they came here. Um, uh, their chronicles kind of um, prolonged that and, and uh, further reinforced it, that image of the natives as being childlike. Remember, he called them ovejas mansas, meek sheep. And so the problem is, right, it was when you realize that they're as human as anybody else, that they are at times capable, oftentimes for their own preservation, of being deceitful, right? Um, then suddenly the disillusionment kicks in and you, you could argue that you have more of a psychological uh, move uh, to punitive anger-based decisions uh, once that image is shattered and you become disillusioned with it. And then with a, and another uh, assumption, of course, is that they were devil-like savages. They were led by the devil. And, you know, you have the, a high influence from still into the early modern era, despite the Renaissance, of the influence of the church. And with the church, right, notions of uh, biblical notions that people who, who follow other gods, and, and, and are ignorant of the true Judeo-Christian Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, are unknowingly led by the devil. Uh, of course, that they don't often know it. And so hence that, that, that the natives were following the devil uh, when they didn't even know it. And you got to remember that the Spaniards, right, they, they were brought up with this Christian belief, uh, with, with, with Christian, you know, um, uh, claims that the Judeo-Christian God is the only God. All other gods are not only false gods, but like I said, oftentimes they are um, a demon in the guise of a god uh, fooling the people. I think of like Desagun, uh, S-A-H-A-G-U-N. Desagun, there's a, in the Spanish literature book, uh, he talks about uh, uh, indigenous Mexican people uh, sacrificing their children to a rain god, right? Uh, uh, to Tlaloc or one of the one of the rain gods, and in doing so, they were crying. So were the children uh, being led to the slaughter. And he depicts it right, and he outright says in in his depiction of this that it, it was such a pitiful sight that rather than just vilifying them as being demonic, following the devil, uh, doing such a heinous deed, right, he doesn't really go that route. As a matter of fact, at the end of his writing in this chapter, he says, La culpa, right, the blame, should not be imputed upon uh, the, 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 the mothers and fathers, nor even the religious leaders who led these poor children to their death. But the blame should be imputed upon our antiquissimo uh, enemigo, uh, Satanas, right, our ancient enemy, Satan, who has blinded them into believing they must engage in such an infernal deed. So that's going to lead to a very paternalistic um, approach, right? Especially under Philip II in his 1573 uh, dis uh, Ordinance of Discovery, uh, whereby he says uh, that the, um, the Spaniards are to care for the eternal salvation of the natives. No more brutality, no more conquering further lands, uh, with the sword and the gun and, and, and the crossbow, but now uh, just hold on to the territory that they've already captured and to try to improve the lives and the well-being and the spiritual salvation of the indigenous people, right, of the, of, of the Native Americans. So hence an example of that type of paternalistic, right, I'm your father, I know what's best, I'm going to teach you the proper way to live, approach uh, I see in the missions, right, in the missions. And you had Jesuits, 
um, go to uh, Arizona and Florida. You had Franciscans go to California and Texas. Uh, I'm sorry, New Mexico. Um, and so, yeah, so it's something to think about. So notice, right, the Spaniards, they have their own worldview from which perhaps they were incapable or it was very difficult for them to extricate themselves, right, to free themselves. They came and saw things in much more kind of Manichaean, you know, black and white, right and wrong, no gray, no no nuance and complexity. Uh, these, these poor natives are, are unknowingly led by the devil, right? Then you had um, commercial class uh, developing and imperialism. So if you look at the, the, the famous rat race in the Indies, right, in the actual Indies in Indonesia, right, in Malaysia, um, and um, uh, in the Indian Ocean, and so forth, right, uh, over in the, the Orient, in the East, uh, you find that the, uh, the system, the old medieval system, uh, began morphing, began evolving uh, into a much more mo uh, monetary or money-based economy. And uh, in particular, a class of people, uh, the euphemism oftentimes was adventurers, who would go and risk everything uh, in trying to uh, acquire uh, commodities, these exotic commodities uh, from the Orient, right? And enrich themselves and, and raise their socioeconomic status. So if you look at like Java and Mocha and these other Dutch and Portuguese Indonesian islands, they kept taking one from another and it wasn't necessarily, uh, if, if ever really, their actual imperial navies that were doing this. It was private merchants uh, flying the, the flag of their home country. Uh, it, it was just, just like a piracy war, if you will. And of course, the, the name of the game was not necessarily, uh, it was not populating a place and taking the land permanently. Uh, it was to extract the, 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 the position and the opportunity to sell a highly coveted commodity. And oftentimes, according to uh, Andre Gunder Frank in his book on this subject, he contends that the profit value could skyrocket more than 400%, like what something was worth in the Indies versus how much more it became worth when they brought it back to Florence and other areas of, of, of Europe. So at any rate, now new opportunities are evolving, right? So people are having an opportunity to pasar mejor, to get, to get along better for themselves and for their families. But in doing so, they have to engage perhaps in immoral means to get to those ends, right? Uh, conquering people, fighting, so violence, uh, theft, piracy, etc., right? And then you have precarious crowns. You look at Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, Ferdinand had a brother. I'm not sure if he was a full brother, uh, but who was also uh, challenging his throne uh, in Aragon. And, um, and so he was on the move at times. Uh, he, he, such was the precarious nature of his rule. And Ferdinand, or Isabella, right, was known as the usurper uh, to her enemies, uh, because her, uh, her predecessor, he had a daughter, but the daughter was an infant, and she claimed the right to take the throne instead, and she wasn't, she wasn't the heir. And so uh, they had people backing up the infant um, uh, for her claims, obviously with a regent to rule until the child came of age. But at any rate, so they, they had reason to fear uh, for their own power, for their own authority, people recognizing and paying homage to that power. So hence, right, thus developed an arguably win-win situation where they could tell someone, hey, if you could somehow muster the resources to go and take over pagan lands and enrich, come back and pay your royal quinto, your royal one-fifth in taxes to us. Also, maybe even in the meantime, uh, claim that land itself for Castile, it's going to enhance my resources. It's going to enhance my wealth in particular as a queen. And it's also going to enhance my credibility within my generation, right? And not to mention they were fighting a reconquista, uh, trying to reconquer um, Spain uh, from the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, a Muslim North African Caliphate um, that had ruled you know, to one degree or another, 
uh, from from 711 uh, AD uh, at the time of Ibn al Tariq. And so at any rate, um, you know, lots going on, right? Lots of context that we need to consider. So hence going back to uh, Columbus, right? He was partially funded privately by wealthy men. Uh, the Italian term for bank is bench. Uh, Italian men would come and sit at a bench and contend, right, with a long line of people, kind of like Shark Tank, I, I'm assuming. I haven't really watched a full episode. Uh, but at any rate, whereby um, they say, why do I want to lend my money to you? Convince me. Tell me why. And of course, right, sometimes the most advantageous thing to, to, uh, to say, to answer, was whatever you want, sir, whatever you like. Okay, then, sometimes perhaps that, that rich, you know, uh, Venetian merchant might say, I want you to. So you had the Cinturones, the Medicis, and these wealthy families who'd say, okay, I want you to go to the Ivory Coast. Um, I want some, uh, I want some um, Ashanti uh, slaves, Dahomey slaves, uh, black African slaves beneath the Sahara Desert, right? Well, if you want to get along better, if you want to lead that expedition, you got to do as he says, right? Or I want you to uh, capture Java and then produce so much coffee uh, from that island uh, to be sold back here or else. So at any rate, you have all that going on, right? And not to mention with the Reconquista, right, is you had the... Um, not only the Pope recognizing the Reconquista as a holy war, but also you had something known as the Patronato Real. And the Patronato, right, gave patronage, gave royal patronage to the Spanish crown, contending, you, Spanish king or queen, right, have the right uh, to make some uh, major decisions regarding the Catholic Church in your own domains, okay? So at any rate, with the Patronato and other things, what they would do is they began granting encomiendas, whereby they would say, okay, I want you uh, to fight against the Muslims here in Cordoba or Granada in southern Spain. And to whatever extent you vanquish your enemy, you could be entitled uh, to a certain amount of land. You could become a lower echelon noble. And my goodness, being a nobleman, right? Remember, aristocracy. Aristoi means the best. That was the best life to have uh, if you're looking at a purely, you know, kind of um, Epicurean way, right? Of just the pleasures of the flesh and, and, and uh, wealth and privilege and opportunities, etc., right? So at any rate, um, that was a good route to take, but it was an amoral route, right? You kind of put ethics aside and said, fine, I'll go kill some Muslims uh, to, to, to advance my family name. So you could become an Hidalgo, and that was a lower kind of nouveau riche um, uh, nobleman, okay? And what do you know? A lot of the people who took the call to become adelantados, going forward claiming new land, or conquistadores, self-styled self -styled conquerors, as Spaniards in the Americas, were sons of Hidalgos in a certain region where the Reconquista was very furiously contested. So, uh, as a matter of fact, they were second sons, if I didn't mention that. So, what seems to, to be an explanation for that pattern is they were sons who saw their fathers fight an alleged holy war, enrich themselves and their sons and daughters and family in the process by becoming successful, not to mention becoming heroes in the local community, but then everything, according to the Mayorasco, uh, like primogenitor, went to the eldest son. So dad gave you a better taste of life. Dad showed you how you could do such. So you want to emulate dad and go across the Atlantic and conquer yourself in the Americas. So a lot of conquistadores fit that demographic. And to a lot of people, that makes perfect sense. All right. Then also note, uh, adding complexity to this situation of just simply vilifying the Spaniards. Charles V, right, or Charles I of Spain, uh, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, um, he issued the new laws and the laws of Burgos, whereby it ended the encomienda, at least on paper, and stated that the, uh, the Native Americans 
uh, were to be free. They were not to be enslaved. Okay. And so then in 1573, Philip II said no more conquering Native Americans to enlarge Spanish American territory. You are to not only care for their spiritual uh, well-being and for their physical lives, but you are to obey and follow because now they are entitled to certain legal rights and protections under the law. All right. So notice it, it's not so black and white of just easily vilifying the Spaniards. Uh, this black legend, okay? Then New World context. Uh, there were popular image issues that I've already gone over, right? Uh, thinking of them as being innocent and childlike and being patronizing toward them and then becoming enraged when they didn't fit that, that, um, that stereotype. There was the image, right, of like Sepulveda and others who contended that they were devil-like and, and they, they just needed to be wiped out via holy war. Uh, or at the very least be given the requerimiento uh, as an ultimatum. Um, you know, they, they brought those images with them and that added to the conflict. And then writings, right, to show nuance to it. There was a guy named Bernal Diaz del Castillo and he contends he's writing the true history, right? La historia verdadera of the conquista. And he's writing it to refute that of Las Casas saying, you weren't there, I was. And his portrait of Moctezuma II, whose picture you see here, Moctezuma II is sly, he's cunning, he's charming, he deceives and even betrays Cortez. I don't want to take the time, I apologize, but it being a U.S. history class and this happening in Mexico, as much as I absolutely love this topic, um, I have to kind of triage. Um, but at any rate, just look at it yourself. It's Castillo's conquest of Mexico or conquest of New Spain. And it's fascinating. It reads like a, like a telenovela, like a soap opera. And so at any rate, um, something to think about, something to look into. Um, but a, a, in his estimation, the Native Americans weren't anything but ovejas mansas. They were very sharp, very cunning, uh, could be very cutthroat. Uh, the Spaniards were numerically the minority and constantly in fear for their lives. So, for instance, at the Cholulan Massacre, uh, supposedly Cortes had already been betrayed by Moctezuma uh, for a successor in the person of Pedro de Narvaez. So he left the capital, uh, the safety of the capital with the emperor uh, to take on Narvaez and his men. When that happened, the Cholulans invited the Spaniards in an alleged moment of weakness, according to Castillo, to a dance. But the dance to, was to Wichpoltele, and Wichpoltele was uh, the, 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 the evil twin of their pantheon of gods, and he was the war god of the Aztec. And so at any rate, um, supposedly, uh, according to his sources, Castillo's, they only engaged in an arete. Uh, I think it's spelled just like an earring today in Spanish. Uh, to this arete was uh, just prior to battle, before an attack. So hence, right, Alvarado decided to engage in a preemptive attack. Get them before the Cholulans could get the Spanish, right? That they were supposed to try to feed, feed them and get them drunk and attack them later that night. So the Spaniards supposedly hit them first while they were dancing and unarmed. So at any rate, you know, I, I don't know if we could ever delve into the, the truth to this, uh, to this day. But the point being, right, is perhaps it's not black and white, uh, this, um, this black legend. All right. And then personal issue, I've already gone over those. Uh, Cortez, supposedly, uh, one of the first issues of friction, according to Castillo's account, was Moctezuma and Cortez were uh, going up into the temple of Wichpoltele. And Cortez said, Moctezuma, you seem to be such an intelligent and, um, and prudent. And um, I'm think, I, I can't think of the other adjective he used, uh, man. But it, it, was, it was a nice complimentary adjective. And he says, that's why it surprises me that you would believe in these gods. Certainly, you know, these aren't not gods, but devils. Uh, let me bring a cross and a portrait of the Virgin Mary up here. And, and that, that started a lot of drama. 
Uh, Zaldivar was the one that was betrayed and killed at Akoma and started issues. Okay, and so you have these issues, right? And then again, system systemic issues. We're going to get into that on in the argumentative assignment. Spanish America as inequitable. Okay, we're almost done here. Uh, the royal bureaucracy. You had the laws of Castile and the royal crown who, who possessed the, the uh, prerogative of the royal veto uh, at the very top. Then you had the Council of Indies, and this was a very small elite group of people. It was like the Bishop of Toledo, Spain, um, and uh, the highest ranking noblemen in the entire country uh, were this small elite group who got to make the laws of the Indies. And what they were supposed to do was largely adhere to the Siete Partidas, uh, the, the Constitution of Castile, um, and but in so doing, adapt to the conditions of the Americas, right? And then you had a, a viceroy, the virrey, the vice king, who would come and be carried on a litter, uh, who had the power of life and death over subjects. Um, it was very powerful position, this viceroy. Uh, the audiencia were the, the court system of oidores, of judges. And so they would come around and they would hear cases and they had a lot of power in, in deciding on adjudicating disputes and those uh, petitioning the state, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then you had governors and the governors handpicked the hated corregidores. And the corregidores, right, like the word corregir, like to correct, um, they had the power uh, to overturn city council edicts. And the city council was arguably all the Spanish Americans had as far as a democratic body of their own pueblo, their own town or city. And now the corregidores could come and, and quote, correct that. They came and collected taxes and they issued the repartimiento. And that was uh, Indios de Repúblicas, uh, natives who were not converted and were living collectively together with one another and still live in a, quote, pagan lifestyle, but subjugated, they had to pay tribute. They had to pay ta special taxes. Um, and in, uh, in addition to that, they had to engage in manual labor to build churches and roads or to fight as soldiers when called upon under the repartimiento. So clearly this is not an egalitarian democratic society we're talking about, right? Then the Casa de Contratación or House of Trade and the Consulados, uh, this was a monopoly-based system, right? This was a mercantilist system. And under mercantilism, the assumption is, is there are only a finite amount of resources, and that is the prerogative of the king and or queen uh, to decide the allocation thereof. So hence, they would decide only certain well-connected people uh, could engage in slave trading. And the big money makers like sugar and cocoa and coffee, right? And of course, gold and silver mining in, in Bolivia and Mexico and Peru. And so at any rate, um, you know, you had to be well-connected. They established only certain cities, uh, Acapulco and others, just a few in Mexico for instance, from where you could trade and you had to have the proper papers uh, to do so. Now, granted, a lot of this was predicated by piracy. Uh, you look at Sir Francis Drake, Richard Hawkins, um, uh, Leclerc, and these other French and English pirates uh, that were, were being um, aided and abetted by their own kings and queens uh, to, to prey upon Spanish shipping, especially trying to get that gold, right? Look up the Madre de Dios episode. And so at any rate, they wanted to have them be shipped. Uh, they, they put a tight rein over shipping, supposedly. But the problem is, is if you're um, just a common average, you know, mestizo living in Spanish America, you don't have any chances of trading in very lucrative uh, markets and lucrative commodities. Okay. And then you had city councils who had um, some voice over their own town or city. Then what was established, uh, what was called, I think this was labeled like in the 1970s, uh, was the, but it was not established in the 1970s, it was established in the 1500s, was a hierarchy based upon the pigment of skin. And look at the Spanish even had visual charts, right? So uh, very interesting. 
um, they actually at times had I issued um, edicts saying you must prove cleanness of blood, right, in order to uh, to migrate to the Americas or to become a viceroy or to be elected as an oidor or judge, etc., right? And that's a bit ironic to me, to be honest, as an aside, because look at Spanish history. You had the uh, Celtic people and uh, mixing with the native Iberians. Uh, you had the Phoenicians come to the bottom of Spain. Uh, you had the Greeks uh, come into the bottom of Spain. You had, of course, the, the, the Moroccans and the Berbers and other North Africans with the Muslim invasion of 711 and um, migration throughout the centuries. Uh, that's, that's crazy to think that they thought they had just clean, pure, homogeneously Spanish blood. But at any rate, they, they likened it, right, uh, to family name and, fa and royal connections and also to skin color, right? And, and hence, it was seen as, as kind of a servile thing to have dark skin, that it, it showed that you were lower class and had to work out with your hands under the sun. And, and it was more prestigious to have light skin. So um, very interesting, this pigmentocracy stuff. So you had the Peninsulares from the Iberian Peninsula who was born. The idea was is that they were socialized in the most sophisticated realm there in Spain. They were taught right from wrong, educated, etc. back in Spain. That their roots were in Spain, so hence they could be trusted, more trustworthy, right, as far as their loyalty. Then second on the rung, so most of the viceroys, without exception, the highest ranking uh, officials were peninsulares, right, who supposedly had pure Spanish blood. The criollos were those who had two Spanish parents, but they were born in the Americas, and they were seen as being a step down because their socialization in America supposedly made them more backward, okay? The criollos largely went to, you know, statistically, there were always exceptions, uh, tried to rise up through the church and the military. Then the mestizos uh, were one Spanish parent and one indigenous parent, right, or Native American parent. The mestizos constituted the vast majority of a lot of the countries. Argentina, Costa Rica, you had your exceptions where they tried uh, to, to issue anti-miscegenation, miscegenation, inter-ethnic sex or marriage uh, laws, believe it or not. Um, but by and large, uh, they adhered to the edict by Ferdinand in the 15 teens that was okay with mestizaje, with miscegenation, all right, as a reality, as a concession, people would say. And then mulattoes, we don't use that term anymore. It's a derogatory term, but if you look at the primary sources, that's why I still put it in there. That's the official name on the chart. The mulattoes or pardos were uh, one African parent and one either um, Spanish with mulatto or uh, indigenous with pardo um, parent. And then you had negros, right? Um, uh, uh, black African uh, people, excuse me. Um, and then you also had um, the Native Americans who had converted, largely who went to the missions, etc., right, and tried to assimilate. They were known as Indios Mansos or you had the Indians of the Republicas uh, who stayed, did not assimilate, and stayed with their own people and their own somewhat autonomous areas of the big cities and areas in Latin America, all right? But in defense of the of Spanish, you had the church and military that anyone could always rise up through, through merit. You had the miscegenation law of the 15 teens that made it actually legal and recognized for black and white, uh, brown and white to uh, intermarry. Uh, good luck finding that in English America, right? You had gracias al sacarnos, right? And this is if like you saved a rich peninsularis son from drowning in a river, did some meritorial, meritorious act, uh, you would be granted uh, literally a paper that said you were to be treated as a mestizo instead of an indio or as a criollo instead of a mestizo on paper because you had done some great act of merit uh, to earn that. 
So that was available. Uh, local markets, according to historian J.H. Elliott, he says that they allowed, the Spaniards allowed um, the, the, the low people um, on the, the socioeconomic uh, pyramid uh, to eat the crumbs off the table. So hence, if it was just a local market, if it was a, a local commodity, even if it was a commodity that they had monopolies under, but you were not trading overseas, uh, the Spanish oftentimes were just, would just tax it and, and turn a blind eye to the official records and allow you to do so. So you did have some commercial opportunities in Spanish America as an average person. And then slaves. Uh, according to Hoberman and Sokolo, and uh, the, they added a book of, of multiple sources. And in their book, they contend that it was a lesser evil to be a slave under the Spanish than it was to be under the English. That you had a wiggle room, if you will, uh, to uh, earn money on the side. Um, oftentimes, for instance, they lived near cities, and we'll get into that with the English. And that provided you more opportunities to gain employment and to buy your freedom, which was called manumission, right? And then you also had the Juez de Residencia, whereby a visitor general, right, would come unannounced and put the local leaders under house arrest and provide anyone and everyone the opportunity to come forward with any accusations of abuse of power. And if they were found guilty by the local, by the visitor general, uh, they were not only removed from power, but could be arrested and sent back to Spain. So hence, they had a system of accountability. And then also, were the English, especially in Virginia, any better as far as having a very hierarchical, uh, inequitable society? And of course, that's kind of a rhetorical question when you read that section. It's meant, the answer is meant to be, of course, they were not any better. Okay. So symbolic figures, right? Uh, two more slides. Uh, you have Las Casas. So he, to me, right, uh, is symbolic of the black legend, right? Likening the, um, the indigenous to meek children. It's called prelapsarian innocence, the name of that stereotype, right? Uh, Don Juan de Oñate, New Mexico. I subjectively would choose them in choosing U.S. territory if I had to write a paper adhering to the black legend and making villains of the Spanish. Castillo, remember he's the one who shows complexity to the Mexico episode. He contends that the Native Americans were anything but, but meek sheep and contends that they were just as capable of guile, deception, uh, brutality as the Spaniards were. And that events kind of just unfolded organically uh, in domino effect fashion that just almost pushed the Spaniards back to the wall and forced them to fight against superior numbers. Junipero Serra, to me, he represents complexity on this issue. Because on the one hand, you have court histories, right? Hagiographies, hey, making saints of these men, showing sacrifice. Some of them, like Luis Jaime uh, in San Diego, uh, were, quote, martyred, uh, trying to do good to the natives, and the natives killed them. In Baja, California, you saw a lot of fraud by the natives. Um, they were caught whipping themselves and cutting themselves and blaming the, the Franciscan friars for doing it. Uh, whenever a, um, a visiting um, Franciscan uh, general, if you will, uh, visited so that they could try to get them in trouble. Um, in Alta, California, you have, um, like I said, cases like the San Diego Rebellion, uh, the Pima and Yuma rebellions of Arizona spread into Southern California. And you could find evidence in some cases of them being predicated, uh, begun by the Native Americans. Revisionist history, however, uh, as you'll look down uh, when I post this, um, this, these slides, you can imagine me trying to do 66 slides. <laughs> We'd be here forever. But further down on this PowerPoint, you have evidence, uh, quotes of people saying that, that the Spanish missions in California were coercive in nature. They forced the natives to do this and do that, that they were downright abusive, that they were exploitative, right? And that they engaged in cultural genocide, uh, getting the Native Americans to kill their own way of life, their own culture, right? And so that's all something to think about. You look at uh, uh, Narciso Duran in San Jose, 
uh, controversial figure. Uh, uh, very, in the one hand, exploitative evidence of him running the San Jose mission like a sweatshop, but also did a lot with and for the Native Americans. So to me, Junipero Serra, he shows the um, complexity of this issue. Um, remember, he was made a saint uh, by Pope Francis, and Native Americans came to the, um, not very long ago, and uh, Native Americans came to the ceremony with signs and so forth to protest it. Then children of Coyote, uh, this, uh, I find that to be a very interesting book where it said that they, by and large, it depicts the California Franciscan missionaries as being well-meaning, but that they inadvertently did a lot of damage with disease, uh, changing their eating and lifestyles, uh, their, uh, their use of resources, et cetera, et cetera. All right. And not to mention another uh, very controversial facet to this is that if you ran away from a mission, right, the uh, assumption was you were going to revert to your pagan ways and hence your soul would be lost and you would not make it to heaven. So the Franciscans felt the responsibility to force you to come back. So they had Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo, that Vallejo is named after, uh, come and try to hunt them down here in the valley of California and forcefully bring them back uh, to the um, to to the missions okay and then also uh, in functional history right just looking at it organically amorally like how did things function how did things right turn out what's the explanation for them now we're no longer getting into you know right wrong etc. Good guys, bad guys, conflict, but just looking at it more amorally. Uh, the, um, the Spanish brought uh, modern law and institutions, right? Remember, an institution is a, a, an officially recognized body of people uh, that serves a societal purpose. So an institution is the family, it's church, it are, their are schools, uh, government entities, the military, etc. right? So it's a very broad, deliberately broad term. And they were largely of Roman and Germanic origin when you look back at Spain and England for that matter. Although you can make the argument that Spain was more Roman than Germanic and make the argument, make the argument, okay? I want to qualify that, um, that England was more Germanic than Roman. So at any rate, with Catholic Christianity, of course they brought that. And remember, uh, everything that that... that that comes with that, right? Uh, down to um, rituals to this very day that Hispanic Americans engage in uh, with holidays, uh, with marriage, um, right? Um, uh, legends, you know, my goodness, La Llorona, Los Duendes, uh, the dance of Los Viejitos, those things that you still see to this day, the Spaniards had here in the 1600s, they brought here. Um, then technology, right? And then regions that were claimed by the Spanish and oftentimes still bear Spanish names. So 1511, 28, and 65, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Texas were claimed by Spanish adelantados, right? Uh, coming forward in their entradas, their entrances, and claiming new land. In 1540, right? Namely, uh, those were mainly um, Ponce de Leon, uh, uh, Cabeza de Vaca and um, uh, uh, Pe Menendez de Avila and uh, Pedro de Narvaez. Then you also in 1540, largely through um, uh, Coronado, uh, Cabrillo, um, and um, I think it was de Soto, Hernando de Soto, they claimed Upper California, Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, the Mississippi River, all right? But notice what region they did not claim. Uh, for instance, like the Northeast, New York, Pennsylvania, the New England states, right? Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, all right? So that's kind of a hint for the test. Now, real quickly, the assignment. Basically on number one, look for evidence of me trying to contend. I'm trying to let 
Christopher Columbus off the hook. And I contend, right? This guy had his back to the wall economically. He could not dictate the terms, the manner by which he could acquire uh, resources on all of his voyages or even on many of his voyages. He had been given strict instructions by the men who were funding his, his expeditions. So hence, when he told Ferdinand, what would you like? Do you want slaves? Do you want this? Do you want that? He owed Ferdinand money. He had to return his investment or it was his neck. Okay. Now, do I go too far? Is it okay to engage in buying slaves, conquering lands, just because you want to free your family from poverty? Like I said, this may have been one of them where I was kind of shaking my head as I was putting it together, which I may or may not agree with, but it's meant to be thought provocative, okay? And I'd love to see why you agree or disagree and show me how it's defended, okay, etc. And then number two, the title says it all, right? Spain enslaved by the prejudices of her time. With this one, right? Look for evidence of saying, you know what? The Spanish were awful on many counts. There was bloodshed. There were, for, there were forced coercion, coercive conversions to Catholic Christianity, right? Forced upon the Native Americans. There was not autonomy or freedom given to Native Americans once they were colonized, right? But the Spanish didn't know any better. That was the world in which they lived. That's what the English, the Dutch, the French were doing. Protestants and Catholics were killing one another. Protestants and Protestants were killing one another. Uh, the Peace of Augsburg of 1555 uh, was agreed upon by many of the highest ranking monarchs of Europe. And it contended that whoever the leader is of a local environment, he or she gets to decide the religion. And the people therein have no choice. So clearly they lived in a different type of, of world, a different time period. They were socialized, taught right from wrong, normative behavior, and a much different world from, from which we were socialized. Okay? And also look for evidence of Christianity itself, right? Of providing them with a worldview, again, that was a bit Machiavellian. Just black and white, right and wrong, only one true God, and, and so forth. Okay, so look for evidence of all that on number two. So do I go too far in defending the Spanish? Show me what you think. And please read all of them, okay, because they all pertain to the test in one way or another. But all you have to do is, is write on one. Hierarchical Spain, right? This adheres to the black legend. This is trying to paint a picture and it doesn't try to defend the Spanish. It does not. That life in Spanish America was very inequitable, unfair, unequal. Not much context to it. I could have done something more sophisticated on number three. And I probably should have. And then deflection. Number four, the title says it all. Look for evidence of just how hierarchical and inequitable English Virginia was. Because remember, uh, an undergirding assumption of the black legend is that the Spanish were anomalously, they stood out uniquely um, awful, inequitable, brutal, intolerant, etc. So number four is good old deflection and saying, well, look how bad the English were in Virginia. Look how inequitable society was there, especially under Lord Barclay. Okay. So I hope this helps you guys. You guys have a great day, a great uh, uh, venture into this. I hope you've learned something and um, I'll, I'll bid you adieu. All right. So take care.